And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to host Navy intelligence turned crime analyst for a detective unit in an undisclosed location in Washington State turned detective novelist turned crime fiction writer, the one and only Spencer Cope, here to spill the tea, as the cool kids say, about his brand new book, Echoes of the Dead, <laughs> about his man tracker for the FBI. I didn't even know there was a thing as such as a thing as a man tracker. I need the full skinny on that. Spencer, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is the, the fourth book in the Special Tracking Unit series. Mm. So it, it picks up with the team again, which is STAPS, the FBI um, tracker, who's got a, a special ability. And uh, it's, a, it's borderline paranormal, but it's based in synesthesia, which is a real condition where like if you if you hear a sound, you'll actually see it. Um, I mean, where the senses are are messed up, so they don't operate the way they normally would. So that's that's the real condition. I kind of take it a, a little further than that into the borderline paranormal. But he can see what's what's called shine, which is people would like look at that as uh, somebody's aura. And every shine is different. He's never come across a shine that's the same, and it's it's both the color and it comes with the texture. So the combination of the two for him are, are like fingerprints. Um, and so he can walk onto a crime scene and he can look around and, and kind of see what happened. And in a lot of cases, figure out who the bad guy is from the shine, but that doesn't tell him who the shine belongs to. So the, the stories you know, for the, the series basically follow that path from knowing the shine and then you gotta figure out who it belongs to. Um, so this one, um, it starts down in Bakersfield when uh, four very powerful men go missing on their annual fishing trip. And uh, this time the, they get a call from the FBI director um, wanting them down there to help out, even though at, at first it looks like maybe they just got lost. Uh, but one of them happens to be a congressman and the Secret Service gets upset when they lose congressmen. And... Um, and so they go down there and, and very quickly start to realize, yeah, this is not a case of missing, missing people. And then it, it kind of takes a dive from there. So. Ooh, well, we're here for it, Spencer Cope, and we're going to do the deep dive with you into all this goodness with you, <laughs> the former Russian linguist, Navy intelligence officer turned crime analyst with a real life detective unit. Um, so much to discuss. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching with us on Facebook, watching on YouTube, watching a murder by the book, well, watching on my channels, watching in mystery and thriller mavens, wherever you're watching from tonight. Welcome. If you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, welcome. You're in the right place. Here's the drill. Every Monday for hashtag mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder. I give you my hand-picked featured authors and you get to ask them anything so ask spencer about echoes of the dead ask him about synesthesia ask him about psychics ask him about malachite we're going to come back to that ask him about the shine we got a lot of questions going just get them right there in the comments and i'll get them right over to him already kicking off debbie welcome she says i can't wait to read the new book debbie i think you're gonna like it ron is saying looking forward to the latest book and others to come. Ron, I think you're going to really enjoy it as well. Now, Spencer, uh, and I also just want to welcome Dana, welcome Cynthia, welcome Chantel, welcome Beverly, welcome Bonnie, welcome everybody. So great to have you here. Ron, uh, okay, any questions? Just get them going right in there. Okay, good. I got Ron's question. Okay, Spencer, so let's get into it. Do you believe in these supernatural powers and do you have any? Um, do I have any? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think that there's just too much in the universe to, to rule things out. And um, I guess my my family has a bit of a history um, with premonitions. And I hear stories from like my my grandmother about, I mean, her side would see angels and and so I, I guess early on you, you hear stuff like that and it kind of fascinates you. And, and plus I had, you know, 
my mom died just before my fifth birthday. Oh, and so when, so when stuff like that happens, I think it kind of, it makes you look at things differently and question things and wonder. And, um, and it, it's, it's interesting because, um, uh, every once in a while, this has only happened a couple of times, but I'll have dreams that are very, very real. And one of them was early in my writing career when I was kind of stumbling and wondering if I should continue with this. And it was of my mom. And it was, I walked at my grandma's and grandpa's place. I walked down the hall and there was this big ballroom, which wasn't there in real life, and a little girl dancing around. And so I started dancing with her and, and she grew into my mom. And then she said, keep writing. It's what you're supposed to do. And bam, that's when I woke up and it was just so real that it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Is that, you know, is that something I better pay attention to? Or um, so I, I don't know, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, I, I don't know what to believe, but I also, I, I don't discount it either. So. Ooh, I like it. I like it. And I agree with you. There's too much out there for us to say with certainty that anything doesn't exist, right? Like we can't disprove it. So I'm open to it. <laughs> George is saying he made it. George Beach, welcome. Great to have you, sir. Thank you. And he's saying good evening from a fellow former nice. Navy crypto intel analyst here george i don't even know what that means but it sounds super cool we're so happy to have you here hosting your fellow navy intel analyst is that is that your correct um well i was a cryptologic technician interpretive cti mm -hmm. when i was in the navy but then i was intelligence operations specialist when i was with naval intelligence uh, as a civilian so Ooh, interesting. All for different titles. And <laughs> Russian linguist. Yeah. Um, tell us what that means. Um, I, I didn't know Russian until I went in the Navy, but uh, I went to boot camp in 82. And right after that, they sent me to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. And of course, the Cold War is going on. This is right around the time the Korean Airlines was shot down. And uh, so that I spent a year there. And it was seven hours a day in class. I mean, you might have six people to a class and this, you know, a, a former Soviet citizen, um, just hardcore, just teaching you. And, and, uh, and sometimes to the point, I've seen guys break down and cry because they couldn't get an accent right. Uh, and it was tough too, because imagine if you're learning English from one instructor from Texas and another from New York. You know, that's the kind of stuff you run into if you got somebody from Kiev and Moscow. And um, so that was a year. And then after that, I went on to another, you know, five, six months of a, a more advanced, like specialized language for the job. And uh, so that yeah, I was very trying, a uh, big sense of accomplishment when you finally get through all of that. Uh, and then, of course, you go on to other um, interesting things once it's all, all the training's done. Wow. Well, I am fascinated. I'm just so fascinated. I think this is so cool. And thank you, sir, for your service. Um, you. George is saying he was in CTT. I don't mm -hmm. even know what that means, but it sounds very cool. Do you know what that means? That's yes. Like yeah, they were the technicians and and you had CTRs, which were the Diddy Boppers. They, they did Morse code and uh, CTMs, which were the maintenance guys, took care of the equipment, specialized equipment that we would use and CTAs were the admin types that would do a lot of the paperwork that came with, with what we did. So yeah, it was a whole specialized Intel group that focused on a very special mission. So. Well, thank you gentlemen for your service. We appreciate you keeping us safe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Debbie is saying, oh, I'm, I think I missed one. I'm sorry about that. Cynthia is saying that she really likes the realistic presentation of dyskinesia. I can hardly believe that he's able to follow his senses and keep them hidden. Yes. So your guy, uh, Steps, he got lost in a forest when he was eight years old. He froze to death. They resuscitated him. And when they, he resuscitated, he has his, his brain had changed and now he sees colors 
the, yeah. from, from with everyone on them and then anything that they touch. So <laughs> staying yeah. in hotel rooms is a special kind of torture for poor steps. Um, what gave you that idea to have this and just and he calls it his shine, which is I love that because you can picture an eight year old boy trying to reckon with what what's happened to him and right. why he's seeing all these colors and kind of being scared and terrified and then grappling with it. And then he learns um, uh, that if he wears lead glass, it prevents it. What gave you the idea to have the lead glass prevent it? I, I, well, I don't know. Things just come to me. It's like, <laughs> okay. I, I figured I need to have some way of just not driving him completely insane. Okay. Because if you think about it, if you looked around, I mean, that's why he's such a book freak. He collects books and he loves books. Because if you think about it, you buy a new book, you open it up, nobody has touched the page. It's all machine made. Also, the reason he likes the sky and the and any water because there's no shine. But for his job, just to function as a human being, he needed to to have something that would block that. And so that's where I was thinking, well, you know, lead, you know, nuclear, you know, it's a good shield for that. So why not go with that? And I thought I needed something that could be hidden. And wearing a pair of glasses, it just made sense to have lead crystal um because that way he could it just look normal and uh and it would do the job so. oh i love that i love that cynthia is saying she thinks there is too much in the universe to say that this is not possible um cynthia weighing in uh, i think uh, both spencer and i totally agree with you um debbie saying she agrees as well um Spencer, now embedded as a, a George, I'm sorry, is saying thank you for your service. Spencer, George, thank you for your service Likewise, as well. Yeah. Debbie would like to know, did anything in particular happen that pointed you in the direction of dyskinesia? Great question. Debbie, Spencer, what gave you this idea? <laughs> well, when I first started thinking about writing a crime novel, you know, I mean, I've been working for, at the sheriff's office for a while at that point. And um, I... I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it because I tried writing a spy novel when I was working for Naval Intelligence and it just, it didn't click for me. You know, I just, it just didn't, didn't work. And so I, I had my doubts and I decided early on, okay, if I'm going to do this, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd written some other books prior to that. I, I figured that I need something that is different. I don't want just another, you know, another alcoholic cop who's on the rebound and has to redeem himself or, you know, all the, the usual, you know, the crime stuff. And so I thought, well, I, there's not really a lot that's been done with tracking. Uh, and then I, you know, the more I thought about it, it's like, I, I can't do that because like when our, our canines go out on a track, I mean, they're there for the track and they do the track. And then within a few hours, it's wrapped up and, and they're gone. And so you can't make a, a novel out of that. And that's when I started thinking, well, what about a human tracker? And not just a human tracker, but a unit specialized in tracking that followed up with the analysis and the police work and the interviews and, you know, chasing the lie, trying to figure out, you know, who did it. And so that's, that's when I started going down that path. And I don't remember what it was that, that kind of flipped the switch and made me think, hey, what if he sees this weird aura that kind of tells him what's going on? And, uh, but it worked, at least in my head, it worked. And then I had the really stupid idea of, of writing it in first person present, which allowed me to get into Step's head. So you have more of that direct, um, you know, access to what he's feeling and, and the, uh, the the problems that he's personally dealing with. But I mean, writing first person um, present is, is really difficult, especially with a crime novel, because you're used to, you know, you see a scene where, you know, this guy's doing this thing and it kind of leads off to something over here or somebody else is doing something. And as the reader, you can kind of draw your own conclusions. You got the red herrings thrown in there. And I can't really do that with, with this series. So it's more of a challenge trying to figure out how I'm going to, you know, craft the story. And I do stick things in every once in a while that are not from that perspective, which is kind of breaking the standard rules, but I, I keep it limited so that I'm not overdoing it. 
Ooh, interesting. Thank you for the inside scoop, Spencer. Um, Debbie is adding the leaded glass is such a neat aspect. I I love that detail too, Debbie. And how he he's a he's a little boy and he goes to a glass blowing mm -hmm. tour with his dad, and then he just happens to be you know looking through the tray, and then he's like, oh my god, I don't you know I'm relieved of seeing the shine that's been ha haunting this poor kid for two years. Um, and that's how he figures it out. I love that. And I loved the idea that uh, I like how he perceives, you know, different colors of, uh, oh, that's like pewter. Oh, that's like malachite. The malachite, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, these elemental, you know, things that we can immediately say, oh yeah, I've seen pewter. I've seen malachite. I know that that shade of green or, or, or his fiance <laughs> is Windex. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Windex blue. I loved that. Um, so Spencer, as someone who is a real life crime analyst currently embedded with a detectives unit in an undisclosed location in Washington State, um, what kind of crazy stuff have you seen on the job that has inspired you to write this kind of crazy stuff on the page? Well, I uh, a lot. I mean, I as a crime analyst, I read a lot of the reports, I get a play. Um, in areas that normally, you know, a lot of people don't get to um, access, like cold cases and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, there's a, just a lot of, I mean, really bizarre things that happen that, you know, the general public just never hears about. And um, I, I try to include things in the story that, um, you know, without, you know, you know, uh, linking it closely to the actual case. Uh, I just borrow from it. And, and really the, the books are just filled with actual things that have happened. I mean, guys, you know, I think in the first book, there was one scene with the, um, uh, where I called it the underwear that crawled, some meth head peeling off his clothes and they, they found him by, you know, following the trail of shed clothes. But we've actually had cases like that where you're walking up the street and you're just following the clothes of this, you know, he's having a psychotic moment or something. Um, and then other cases, um, I just, just, I mean, the craziest things you can imagine. Uh, and also stuff that, that really tries you. I mean, there is a, a re, recurring character in the story, Leonardo, a serial killer. He's the one that got away. He's the one that Jimmy and Steps have not been able to figure out you know, who it is. And it's really close and personal to Steps in particular uh, because he knew one of the victims. But they've been trying to figure out who this guy is forever. And that's actually based on a cold case that I had worked on for years and years. And it was kind of born out of the, the frustration of, I mean, we had DNA. All we needed to do was figure out, you know, who it matched. And so we were doing DNA sweeps with all of our primary suspects. We were doing all kinds of stuff trying to figure out, you know, who this guy was. We knew it was somebody that was probably close. And uh, so that character actually came from that case, just the, the frustration of not being able to figure out who he was. And it, for the record, we eventually did. In fact, when I wrote Collecting the Dead, um, it wasn't too long, within a year, I think, after that, that we actually got a tip that led us to our suspect and he's in prison now. So, so yeah, there's, there's stuff like that in there and I'll, I'll make references. I mean, off the wall references, like a, a, there's a reference to um, Elder Futhark, which is the <laughs> Norse language of um, the Vikings from the second century to the eighth century, I think it is, but it's big with the, the white supremacists, uh, the neo-Nazis, they, they do tattoos with that. And so I had a, a white supremacist in the first book, and he was all tatted up with Elder Futhark. And I, you know, that's something I just, you know, I learned on the job and learned how to read it because I kept seeing these ruins and they'd even use it in, in letters from the jail. You'd see Elder Futhark show up. So, yeah. So, yeah, there's, again, there's all kinds of stuff in there that if it looks really weird, it might be related to a real case. So. Wow, we will keep our eyes peeled for that. Thank you, Spencer. Um, Debbie is saying she really likes how steps can tell if someone is still alive by their shine. Oh, Debbie, good, good, uh, good insight there. Yeah. So for those um, who haven't read this, who haven't read the the books in the steps series, Spencer, tell us about that. Yeah, it's something that I added because I wanted a, a ticking clock. 
you know, to build that drama. And, and what better way to do that than um, rather than wondering if your, your victim is still alive or, or if they're already dead, you've got the shine, it kind of pulses when they're alive and then it just kind of flattens out uh, and is still when they're dead. And so when he sees shine related to the victim, um, steps can tell if, if they're still alive or if they've already expired. And, and that just kind of, I mean, not that he isn't really hard driven to figure it out in the first place, but sometimes it, it just becomes obsessive for him. He just has to find them, um, you know, before that, that shine just goes flat. Um, and what gave you that idea? I mean, I, I also love that, Debbie, and how it pull, he, he says it pulses with life as, a, as an actual living thing, as something from this, and, and that it has to be made contact with, like a footprint. It mm -hmm. has to have some level of, of of not just touching, but, you know. Pressure. Oh, yeah. Pressure, thank you. Yeah, really cool. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess part of that is looking at the shine is maybe related to the soul. And so that it leaves that residue wherever it goes. And while the, the soul is still in the body, it's like um, it, it's vibrant like the soul. But once mm -hmm. once the soul leaves and and there's I can't remember which book it is, but I actually have a scene where steps. He, he's seen this on rare occasions where he sees the shine, you know, rising up from somebody who's died. Um, but again, it's only a couple of times. That, again, that's one of those little paranormal things that that I kind of stick in there to, I don't know, kind of. Well, I can talk about paranormal stuff all day, but y'all, this is your turn to talk to our featured author. So what do you want to know about Spencer? What do you know, want to know about Echoes of the Dead or uh, Spencer's writing? Anything you'd like to ask the incredible Spencer Cope tonight, get those questions going. Um, I'll always, I give you, I'll give you a moment because I know it always takes me time as well. Um, so Spencer, the Associated Press raved that this book is suspenseful, unfolds at a rapid pace. It really does. Um, and one of the things I noticed is that you have deliciously short chapters, which tricks me into thinking, oh, I can fit one more in before I go to bed. And next thing you know, it's 3 a.m. And I'm, I'm, I, I've read another 80 pages, but then I keep thinking just one more because they're nice and short. Um, what, how do you do, how do you execute that besides these deliciously short, <laughs> someone's <laughs> laughing at me on Facebook, uh, right? We can relate to that. Am I right, fam? Um, so Spencer, besides short, deliciously tasty chapters, how, from a craft perspective, your four book, books in, how are you doing that? Tell me. Well, I, I lay out the whole story before I actually start writing it. Um, and I learned that lesson the hard way. The first book I wrote, which has never been published, uh, and this was 30 some years ago, um, I decided, you know, I'm going to sit down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this book. And I started at the beginning and didn't plan the whole thing. out. I knew where it was going, but I hadn't laid the whole thing out. And you want to talk about writer's block. Because if you don't have other places you can go to, if you get stuck right here, you're you're there until you figure it out. And so it took me two years to get that thing written. And uh, the one I wrote after that took me four months to do the first draft um, because I, I just decided I'm not doing that anymore. And I came up with my own what was my own way at that point. And I've modified it with, you know, insight from others. Um, since then, but I just laid it out chapter by chapter, start with one sentence for each chapter and then just kind of fill it in. And that allows me when I when I have a piece of dialogue that comes to me at three in the morning and I scratch it down, I, I have some place where I can put it, you know, like I know that that would be perfect in this chapter over here. And so I'll plug it in. And that way, three months later, when I get to that chapter, I haven't forgotten it and it's right where it belongs. And so I do that. And then once I get the basic outline done, I try to expand it to a paragraph or two until I have a, a fairly good gist of the story and I've worked out some of the bugs. So. Ooh, thank you for that. 
uh, inside scoop. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's waking up at 3 a.m. No. <laughs> um, Lise is saying, I haven't read these books, but it sounds fascinating. I'm going to pick up the books. Lise, thank you so much. I think you'll thank really you. enjoy them. And I'm going to pop the link in the comments. You can grab your copy tonight and support a woman owned independent bookstore. I'm talking about our favorite murder by the book, y'all. Um, so grab your copy tonight of not just this book which comes out on october 5th we're getting the inside scoop before this book has even hit the shelves and it will ship to you the day it comes out you can also get spencer's backlist his first three books in the steps series um ron is saying i love that steps has to fake knowing actual tracking techniques in order to explain how he does it ron cool insight spencer give us the scoop on that yeah, I mean, that's a problem when you're supposed to be the world's greatest tracker and you can't really track that well. You're just following these, you know, these signs that are invisible to everybody else. And so he's had to learn, you know, some of the basics of human tracking just so he can point out things. And now, obviously, for him, it helps because he can already see where the heel of a foot landed. So he can look for a crushed leaf or, you know, something like that that he can point out. But um, you know, he's when he's out there and he's working with these other agencies and he's leading the team, I mean, all eyes are on him. And, you know, you have a lot of people in law enforcement that they may not be officially trackers, but they do know a few things about that. And uh, so, it, you know, it, it's a challenge for him to maintain that, you know, that cover. And especially when he knows, um, you know, who did it, once he matches up the shine to somebody, then they have to kind of find the real means of showing that this person did it. Cause you can't go into court and say that, you know, I, well, I followed his aura and it was on the murder weapon cause they're going to lock you up. So, so that's always a challenge. Yeah, it would be, it would be tough to go into court and say, I followed his aura that I would not want to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cynthia is saying she loves the results of your challenge. Debbie is seconding that. Thank you, lady, so much. Ooh, Debbie wants to know, did you talk to anyone who has dyskinesia to get some insight into how steps would see, see something, see things? No. And you know what, if I could have found somebody, I, I mean, that would have been awesome um, just to, you know, first of all, trying to understand how that that would work for them. Um, but I for me, I just do a lot of research and um, a lot of reading and just kind of try to, you know, figure things out that way. Um, the, the fun part about being a writer, though, is when you do have the chance to go talk to people or visit locations. And I, I wrote a, um, a, a ghost story about Gettysburg years and years ago. And I actually got to go to a, you know, a haunted house uh, on the outskirts of Gettysburg that had been converted to a field hospital during the battle. And they had all kinds of really cool stories. So, I mean, it just adds to, you know, when you get down to writing the story, having those experiences, um, let you put more into it to make it more, you know, realistic. So uh, anything like that, if I can do what I do, try to do that, but not in this case. Oh, thank you for the insight on that. And uh, that sounds like an intense ghost story. Yeah. Um, saying it took him as some effort to get used to the first person perspective, mm -hmm. but it really makes the story unique and pulled him in. Ron, I totally, I love first person because I want to get mm -hmm. in that person's head. I want to get in their mind. I want to get in their point of view. It's a chance uh, for me to walk in the shoes of, of these other people. I don't have synesthesia. I don't see colors. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, I think, although it would be cool. Um, it might drive me crazy. So uh, let us know in the comments. Would you want these powers? Yes or no? Um, the other thing that I really enjoyed about this book, Spencer, is you, you're funny. You're really, I think you're funny. Um, you have a wonderfully dry sense of humor where, you know, from the, and I knew I was going to like it when from the very, from page 12, um, when he's talking about how, you know, uh, Steps is saying he, he and his special, his partner, special agent, Jimmy Donovan, look for the lost, bring justice to the dead and hunt some of the sickest minds our society has ever produced, which is no small task. Then he adds, 
the medical and dental plans are also excellent. <laughs> uh, he's so funny. I, and, it, and it's that sense of humor that carried me, uh, one of the many things that carried me through this book. Um, are you effortlessly funny or are you cracking yourself up or are you, do you have to go back and insert that later? How's that work? You know, I think I give steps credit for that because I don't know that I'm that funny, but um, it, it's, it's um, interesting because I'll get, that's one of the things that I get uh, hit up on quite a bit. Uh, I have one reader who says she cracks up every time she thinks about one line about, I blame it on the trees. And <laughs> that's like her favorite line from the, the latest book. And um, I, I don't know, these things just, you know, they just come out and I put them down and if they work, they work. And um, it's nice when you have a character who's supposed to be kind of snarky like that. And, and because you kind of um, kind of let, let loose a little. And I, I think for me, I'm, I'm very much an introvert. I think a lot of writers are. And um, when I'm comfortable with people, like um, in my office, uh, I, I'm by myself now, but I think they split us up because we got too noisy. But we had uh, one of the detectives that I worked on cold cases with, and then one of the um, assistant crime analysts, we were all in there. And it was constant laughing out of that office because we were always cracking each other up. So I think there's a little bit of it that comes natural when I'm comfortable with the people I'm around or when I'm writing. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't know if I'm that funny, but <laughs> as long as it's funny when it's written down, it's good. Yay. Okay. Um, Cynthia is saying that Steps' self-awareness mm -hmm. keeps him fascinating. Ooh, Cynthia, that's a really good point. And I hadn't thought of it like that, but now that you're saying it, it's so true because he is very aware. He's, and he's, I love how he's read all these books. And so he knows all this random knowledge and can help Jimmy with crossword puzzles or whatever. Um, and, and, and that is, a, that's, that's fun. And he also is aware that people don't, aren't always going to believe his um, talent, his gift, his, you know, he feels sometimes it's a burden. So that's, you're right. He is very self-aware and that does keep it interesting. She's adding that the issue is what makes him so human and believable. Um, yes, I love that. You're totally right. That's such a great point. Thank you so much for chiming in with that. Melissa says, hi, Sarah. I'm late. Glad I'm here live. Melissa Watson, mystery and thriller maven member. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you. You're not late. You're just on time. Um, all right, you guys, we have time for two or three more questions for Spencer. Um, so get them going in the comments. And Spencer, I have another, I'm scrolling back, another question for you as well. Um, one of your other reviews was talked about, um, here it is, the relentless pacing and an impressively naughty plot. Let's talk about the pacing and the naughty plot. Would you <laughs> describe it as naughty and how'd you knock that up? So, um, well, I mean, it's always a challenge trying to come up with something that people are not going to figure out right away. And so, you know, I think that, I don't know that it's necessarily naughty, Um but I do have a lot of little things going on and a lot of stuff that needs to be sorted out just to kind of keep things, you know, moving along. And, and I, I think I write very tight um, so that, you know, I try not to waste a lot of uh, words or have scenes that are just, uh, you know, a lot of waste. And um, so that's, uh, that's part of the pacing. It's just everything's just boom, 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 boom. Um, leading to the next thing. And I think that lends to that impression of, you know, boom, here's one thing, here's another thing. And, um, and then you're, you know, you got all this stuff going on. So uh, but that's pretty much the way they all are. I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that I, I've kind of, uh, from the, you know, crime novel standpoint, I've, I've kind of improved my technique um, as the series has progressed. And I probably write a little more tightly than I did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um I don't have like I haven't had in the first book I had plane talk, which is a little thing that the Jimmy and Steps would do when they're they're traveling, you know, to a location. They they have a G1 uh, Gulf Stream that you know flies them around the country. So one of the perks of the job. <laughs> um, but you know that's a lot of air air time, and so they kill some of that time, you know, with with plane talk, which is 
useless facts and stuff like that. So a lot of that stuff I haven't really included in some of the, the last books, but um, you know, it's always there. Maybe I'll revive it and, you know, throw it in the next one. I like that. Um, ooh, George has a good question. He says, are we talking about dyskinesia or synesthesia? Good point. We're talking about synesthesia. Synesthesia, right? yeah. That's, that's the thing with the colors where people yeah. see colors. Right. Yeah, and yeah. it's just it's so bizarre. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about, you know, somebody playing the piano and somebody with synesthesia would actually see, you know, the, the different notes. I mean, mm -hmm. not looking like a note, but they would see something that would represent that sound, uh, whether it's a color, whether it's a shape. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and it's just something crossed up in the way our senses process. But I mean, I've always been fascinated with that anyway, how the brain, I mean, really, you think about it, um, everything that we know, perceive, understand is just based on stuff that's coming into our brain. And if some of that gets crossed up, um, or hijacked or, you know, who knows what, I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff though. Just for clarity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and put the synesthesia, the definition of synesthesia from Healthline right in here so we can all just get super clear on it. Um, so synesthesia is a neurological condition uh, in which information meant to stimulate one of your senses stimulates several of your senses. So people who have synesthesia are, car are called synesthetes. Um, they can often see music as colors, just as Spencer said, um, and taste textures like round or pointy when they have eat food fascinating i actually have two friends who have synesthesia and really? they, they don't see music or taste pointy i've never heard that but they see letters and numbers as colors so sarah mm -hmm. might be like you know a blue s a green a a yellow R and then a green A. So I'd be green and yellow and, and, and <laughs> blue. Spencer would have the same, his S would be the same, but then because he has a P, SP instead of SA, it would look different. And so they see colors um, for letters and numbers and one only sees numbers as colors and one sees letters as colors. It's so were they so were they confused when they saw the Google logo and it all that different? <laughs> I mean, so that's kind of what they would see it as, right? I mean, that's, yes. that's, that's such a good point, Spencer. You know what? I'm going to ask. That is a really, really great question. Um, now, so this, oh, I was going to ask you, does that happen when they're like reading a letter too? Or is it only on larger? No, like all the time. Really? So wow. it must be hard for them to read, you know, to, yeah. you know, to, it must be, or beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> um, that isn't how my brain works. <laughs> Spencer, you not just have, you have echoes of the dead coming out October 5th. A link. Oh, Melissa is saying, this is so fascinating. Melissa, I totally agree. You have echoes of the dead coming out October 6th, y'all. Um, and you have another book coming out October 12th. Tell us about that one as well. Yeah. Uh, it's the last ride of the bumblebee jacket not a crime novel. Um, it's more literary fiction. Um, and it's a lot of stuff from my own life kind of dumped in. And um, it just uh, it involves tens of millions of dollars in lost art, this vintage convertible, Plymouth convertible, and then this group of people that kind of come together, one of them to buy the car from this old lady, and then the others have different parts that they play as well. And it's like, um, the, this elderly lady has all these secrets and the car is one of them. And as they start to decipher what the car really is, um, it unlocks other things and other information. And then they call in an expert from the Seattle Art Museum. And, and it's all based in, in Bellingham, um, you know, the whole story. So, uh, and it's just, it's one of those that, uh, uh, you know, for anybody with a soul, you'll, you'll be crying by the end. And, and it's just, it, it's a, a feel good book. So. Oh, I love that. I love that. Spencer, one thing I wanted to ask you is this book, the, um, when the four guys are kidnapped and steps and Jimmy are tracking them down, bad things happen to those four guys. Yeah. Um, very violent things. How did you come up with those things um, the different torture techniques is that, I don't know if that's right. The right term. How'd you, how'd you come up with some of this stuff? <laughs> I didn't even know this stuff existed. I was like, 
Yeah, um, I'm sure if people looked at my uh, my search history, they'd be concerned. So, um, yeah, without giving too much away, you know what that stuff leads to, the conclusion they finally draw. So I needed to come up with different elements that I could throw in with each one of them that would lead to that final conclusion. And uh, so I just, you know, I kind of thought about that whole process, you know, what, what would be involved with, um, I'm trying to talk around it here without giving too much I can't even do a corner, Spencer. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's a method to the madness. And each one of those, I mean, and it, I have to tell you, I think it is my darkest book. I mean, it's certainly the most um, violent crime scenes. Um, so, you know, from that aspect, it, and it was parts of it were you know, pretty brutal to write, too. Um, but yeah, each each one of the elements that happens in the story leads to something related to uh, the discovery towards the end. So. Oh, I was muted. I didn't want okay. to. <laughs> My dog was going to start barking. Melissa, I know you can relate because I see your profile picture is a dog. Um, thankfully, she's being good. Uh, mine is. Okay. She, Melissa wants to know, um, is this a series? Mm -hmm. And which one in this book is the is the first? So this um, is the fourth book in the step series. So give us the skinny on these. So this is collecting the dead. This is when you first meet Steps and Jimmy, and you learn about his special ability. And this one takes place in Northern California, where some women have gone missing, and he's called in to uh, to do some tracking. And uh, this is one of those cases where that vibrating shine that tells you whether they're alive or dead really comes into play. And I've had people contact me and tell me that you know, they'd never cried reading a crime novel, but with this one they did. So um, it just because, you know, again, you're able to get into Steps' head because it's first person and it becomes very personal to him. So um, then there's um, Whispers of the Dead. Uh, that one takes place um, all over between uh, El Paso and, um, you know, Tucson, um, mostly in El Paso. And um, it's a it's a different kind of serial killer. And it's one that I would say that towards the end, you start to, to empathize with them a little bit. You know, once things are revealed and you start to discover, you know, the method to his madness. Yeah. You know. Um, and then Shadows of the Dead, this one came out last August. Uh, that one's, this one here is closer to home. It takes place on the Olympic Peninsula. And then also uh, there's a lot of activity between like Everett and Tacoma. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's an interesting one because there's two bad guys in this one. One that you meet right at the beginning. And then the one that's more sinister and manipulative um, you don't, you know, discover who he is towards the end, but, um, they're working together, but they've never met. And then you learn how that came about. And, uh, and it just, it's the book with the least actual bodies in the story, but the, I think the most victims, um, because you just don't, you know, there, and I don't want to go into that because it's, there's a really eerie cabin scene in in the olympic mountains where they make a discovery and and start to realize what might be going on so so yeah that was number three and then uh echoes is number four so i have plunked the link to every single one of these four books in the comments so that you can grab number one number two number three and number four coming out october 5th and if you'd like to peruse the whole list and see um, here's the link to the whole list as well. So again, all three backlists, because you know, once you, what you're going to fall in love with steps, you're going to fall in love with Spencer, they're going to read them, want to read them all, or you might want to read them in order. Um, here they all are y'all. Um, okay. Just want to make sure. Oh, Kendra is saying Spencer Cope is a mix of Barry Eisler and Stephen King with his own style. Every book just gets better and better. Shadows of the Dead was better than the movie Silence of the Lambs. Kendra Cook, strong praise there. Um, well, thank you for joining us. I, I think my daughter would disagree because Silence of the Lambs is her favorite movie. So, well, 
Uh, Kendra sounds less biased than your daughter. I'm going to believe Kendra. So. <laughs> uh, Melissa saying, thank you. They all sound terrific. Absolutely. Margaret Pernard, your fellow Washingtonite, oh. uh, tuning in from Portland, although I think she's on the road. She said, I'm so far behind on the new books, but happy to just be getting into Laura Bazelon's book. Finally, another murder street. Great for an Amtrak ride. Margaret, this is your fellow Washingtonite. Is that, if that's the word, your Washington state resident, uh, Mr. Spencer Cope joining us live tonight. So great to have you here as well, ma'am. Um, so Spencer, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for giving us the inside scoop on Echoes of the Dead uh, coming out October 5th, everyone. George is saying, thank you, Sarah and Spencer. I see a new series of my future. Yes, right. George Beach, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Margaret saying yay for the Pacific Northwest Wonderland. Washington, oh, Washingtonians. I'm sorry, I was saying Washingtonians. Washingtonians can hang. Yes, ma'am. Um, and don't forget to join my Facebook group to continue the conversation, my Mystery and Thriller Mavis Facebook group, where we nerd out about our favorite books. You enter giveaways. We have a lot of fun over there. I'm plopping the link in the comments, free and open to all. Y'all, it has been a wonderful night. Thank you to naval intelligence analyst turned crime analyst, detective and crime fiction author, Spencer Cope. Cynthia saying, I can't wait to read the latest books. Absolutely, Cynthia, grab your copy tonight. Thank y'all for spending Monday night with me. Hashtag mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder. I'll see you <laughs> next Monday. Have a great evening. Thank you.